بشمين بشم شماغل بوليتيكا ودباتن بشم كلهم بوليتيكا ودبات اب ستوكولوم انكو عاد حان مصاحبكم بل نقولوا تخافلتي لو مالتيو كوم هون نغايشنا بفلي زبلخا دكتور عند برهان ولد جرجيس دكتور ادريس ابو بكر كما قال قطامي صبو عبد الكويني لومي دكتور يوسف مسان الله مالتي كما هو غادي تغادر محمد برهان بزحات الله سلاز نقولكم غادي تغادر ابراهيم غادي الله سلاز انكم قاعد حمتاكم بل ازي لوراي لومي سيمينار بعتاو مجمرتا كم بوليتيكا ودبات بحان سبب شودن نغورو زنا سيمينار يو سلازي اتي اب هاجرنا زركب زلون اب تخباب زركب زلون حدا انا بابا خلونا النا كم جمرتا سيمينار كلت دوكا عدينا انا مالتيو سلازي كلكم كو عفان صحوم تسفا غير تصبو مشيت مسانا تحلفو اولا احيي الجمع الغفير اولا نشكركم على الحضور ونشكر ايضا دكتور عند برهان والقرقيس وايضا دكتور ادريس ابو بكر وايضا معنا الان فرصه جميله دكتور يوسف برهانو المناضل دكتور يوسف برهانو وايضا ابراهيم لاتا مناضل قديم وايضا الاستاذ ابراهيم قدم وخليفه عثمان طبعا فهذه اول مبادره من التنظيمات السياسيه الاريتريه في ستوكهولم برعايه التنظيمات السياسيه ان نعقد سيمينار يعني نقيم فيها او كمان ننظر فيها او نقرا فيها قراءتنا عبر مختصين للوضع في القاره الافريقي وايضا في الوطن العربي، هناك اريتريا الان تت... هناك تدخلات في اريتريا، هناك تاثيرات في داخل بلدنا وطننا، حقيقه نحتاج انه احنا يكون عندنا قراءه مشتركه، فلذلك جبنا ناس مختصين حقيقه ونستطيع من خلال الاسئله يكون عندنا على الاقل معلومات وضع بلدنا الداخلي والخارجي. فحيدير هذا اللقاء باللغه العربيه اخونا وايضا بالتقرينيا اخونا نقاش عثمان وايضا يقدم الدكتور ادريس ابو بكر وايضا اخونا نور اخونا نور ايضا حيقدم الدكتور نور احمد حيقدر الدكتور عند برهان ولد قرقيس اذا ما نبنزي لومي بحاولنا نقاش عثمان بنور احمد ناي كلتي يوم اغرب تخون يوم لذي نقول عبد الحمد اخوكم وشكرا لكم شكرا لك. طبعا المواضيع اللي اخترناها لهذا السيمينار مواضيع غايه في الاهميه هي لانه اريتريا تعيش في محيط الاوضاع السياسيه فيه متقلبه والجيو سياسيه ما سميناها ان كان في شبه الجزيره العربيه وكان على الشمال شرق افريقيا خاصة على ضفاف البحر الاحمر يعني هذه التداخلات الموجوده وتاثيرها على اريتريا وعلى امنها بالتالي ايضا انا اتوقع من خلال المحاضرات المحاضرتين اللي حتلغى من قبل الدكتور ادريس والدكتور عند برهان سيتم تسليط الضوء على دور النظام في اريتريا بالتالي يعني أول باكورة عمل التنظيمات السياسية خلال هذا العام كان هذا البرنامج أتمنى أن نكون حنواصل برامج مشابهة ما يخص إريتريا ما يخص قوى المعارضة ما يخص دورنا نحن بالتالي أعيد شكري وتقديري لحضوركم جميعا وللرموز والقامات الوطنية الموجودة بيننا نحن نزيع رسي خبتي كم مرة درخنا إرترا بين تنت إلى تنبت حجر يكون أبتزون أنا في اللابتي وش عربي خو ويك أب حفش وأب أبتي كبابي نازل كبهجرات أب سمين مرا لي كنا في أفريقيا يكون كم أول أب جمع جمع أي بحري بغلتي ومالتي زلوا روسي زلوا كنات بقطة ني كنات هجرنا صليه أنا بقمتاتي أبتزقرب مدرة أكلتي أم 
دکتر اطمان دکتر ادریسین کن دکتر عنده برهان گده نیزی ها به ارشاد الله سرعت ها به مسوار نیزی و تا ویون انتایو به ارشاد عبیز الله دی سعب زخیل نیزی سلواتات و فلا تا علو تاو سلوات مالتی انتایی زیسل که نزاره بینا نیزی تی در رحلا نیزی سلوات مرز كما جمر تاني حبار سراح حبزي حدش حمد كم بوليتيكاوي ارساو تقاومو والدبات نزي ممراتنا زي يوتي دفئنا قلت اتسالي نعون كومو دا مثلا مدبات حيزنا كن قربينا سلازي دقيمي نتوم اقايشنا وقال حلمة ساخم نتوم نزي اخيبا اخبيركم قد يخم اخبيركم ابسرحكم دلوكم كلاكم هكراين ارساين قدني اللابل أيضا حيوانية كبيرة في هذه المنطقة وصل في الصومال وفي مناطق أخرى أيضا عندها ثروة مائية تختل بالمناطق الأخرى فهي تعتبر خزار مائي وهو السلعة اللي فيها السرعة والتنافس المستقبلي أبا هاجر الله دوبو كابي أسرى نالما سألي أرزيز خابز حياته قل تاريخ ناي وران تاريخ ناي وكينات تاريخ ناي حمى عزم في الناتات تسلية قالوا أذكر من زيادة التليان زينا وريق ولا هنا من فرط الله تحمى زيادة التليان إن شاء الله سعمد كوينات سعبوا زيسل ناي كل استعمد ناي دوب كوينات حجي زي انت عايز فتح will be uh, holding a seminar on the challenges and opportunities for democratic transition in Eritrea. So before we go into that, I will mention some of the credentials for Dr. Anderham. 1969 till 1972, lecturer in management and economics, Haile Selassie University, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. 1972 to 1976, Chairman Eritreans for Liberation in North America. 1977, Member Central Committee of the EPLF, which is now the Central Council of the PFDJ. 1977 to 1980, Deputy Secretary, Department of Information, EPLF. 1980 to 1987, Head, Foreign Information, EPLF. 1987 to 1989, Deputy Secretary, Depart Department of Education, EPLF. 1989 to 1991, Editor of SAGIM, Organ of the Eritrean People's Liberation Front. Uh, 1991, Member of Eritrean National Assembly. 1991 to 1993, President of University of Asmara. 1993 to 1994, Governor of the Bank of Eritrea. 1995, he was a member uh, select task force to re restructure the government, streamline the civil service and private, privatize public enterprises. 1995 to 1999, ambassador to the EU, Benelux, France, Portugal, Spain, the UK and permanent representative of, to the UNESCO and IMO. 1997 to 1999, Ambassador to the Democratic Republic of Congo and Special Envoy to the Great Lakes Region. 2000 uh, to 2002, Commissioner for Coordination with the UN Mission in Eritrea and Ethiopia, ANMI. 2002 until 2006, Ambassador to Belgium, the EU, Luxembourg, Portugal and Spain. 2007, uh, from February to June, Africa Advocacy Director, International Crisis Group, ICG. 2007, July, Senior Advisor, Africa Program, International Crisis Group, ICG. So this is uh, quite a bit of the match, huge uh, personal CV of the well-respected Ambassador Dr. Andebrahan Olda Georgis. Now we will, uh, I will, hand you over to Dr. Andebraham Olde Georgis. He will cover the, cha the challenges and opportunities for democratic transition in Eritrea. Thank you, Samar. I would like to begin by thanking the Committee of Political Organizations in Sweden 
which kindly extended me the invitation and gave me this opportunity uh, to meet with you this evening. It's a very commendable initiative, and I would like to encourage them to consolidate and expand this initiative, because what we lack in Eritrea, or in the Eritrea and diaspora, I should say, I should be more specific, is the ability to come together in an inclusive forum like this and exchange views, views about our country, views about our region, and views about how events and developments outside our region, global events, affect us, our people, and our struggle for change and democratic transition. I think when we talk about the challenges and opportunities for democratic transition in Eritrea, there is a lot that we can say about the present situation in Eritrea in the first, the first place. But we all know what's going on. We have all our own sources with family members, with friends, for uh, former fighters, former comrades in arms, etc., etc. So we are all linked. One factor that binds us together is that Eritreans, maybe we're a small people, a small country, we really are very attached to our country. It's this unfortunate situation that has forced us to scatter all over the world. And so I would like to focus on what we can do to own our situation and secure our future, especially when the majority of you are youngsters, young people. You are tomorrow's Eritrea. We represent its past and partly its present, but the present and the future is wholly yours. And what happens to Eritrea a few decades down the line is going to be shaped by you and people like you in Eritrea, in the region around Eritrea, or scattered worldwide, so-called Eritrean diaspora. Today, when we speak about Eritrea, we know that the objective and subjective conditions for change are right. It's really high time for us to own our present and seize our future. The survival of the state of Eritrea and the well-being of the Eritrean people demand change and democratic transition. And the sooner this happens, the better off Eritrea and its people would be. However, we must also recognize and bear in mind that changing an authoritarian regime like ours is not an easy task. It's in fact very, very difficult. When change happens, the process of political transition is going to be even more difficult and more complex. And so effective execution of change and democratic transition would require preparation, foresight, and prudence. There is so much that can be said about the extent of despair shared by many Eritreans, whether at home or in the diaspora. But it's very important for us to get rid of this despair and to nurture hope. And the saying goes, where there is hope, where there is life, there is hope. And hope is a powerful force for change. Hope, conviction, and confidence are decisive for, successive, for successful action in any endeavor. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you set out to do. It can be a small thing, a big thing. Politics, politics is a struggle for power, nothing else. 
But he must have hope. He must have conviction. He must have confidence that change is possible. Democrat democratic transition in Eritrea is doable. It's not just an idle dream. It's not an idle wish. But it's something that can happen. And it's only us who can make it happen. But when we talk about change and transition, we're also, in a dialectic sense, talking about change and continuity. Change of the authoritarian regime, continuity of an independent, sovereign Eritrean state. The people of Eritrea have paid a huge price to make a sovereign Eritrea possible. Independence is a historic and great victory of the Eritrean people. It enabled Eritrea as a nation to gain its right self-determination and to take its rightful place among the community of nations. Eritrea is a member of the UN, AU, IGAD, etc., etc. Uh, I mean, legally it's, uh, it's qualified, it's, uh, but of course the role it plays is a function of the kind of regime we have. But a transitional uh, or a political transition from an authoritarian regime that we have into a democratic regime that we wish to have would require a period of transition, preparation. Because you have a regime that had its rules, its institutions, its pro procedures, its practices. When you talk about the regime, we're also talking about this, what we call, maybe it's Latin, modus operandi, the way it operates, the way it runs the government, the way it uh, relates to the people, the way it represents Eritrea's interests in the region outside, etc. Et All that must be changed and replaced by a new region that's democratic. Furthermore, it will be necessary to establish and strengthen functional institutions. Today in Eritrea, there is no institution that functions. There is no institution that delivers the social goods and services that our people need in order to earn their livelihood, in order to improve their lives, in order to change this situation of impoverishment into a state of uh, prosperity. And of course, when we talk about change, we must realize that although very often, and we do wish, that the change we desire is from the present authoritarian regime into a democratic regime, the process of change may take place, may unfold in different forms, and with different contents. In the specific case of Eritrea, we can envisage three scenarios. One scenario would be, of course, a change with very slight changes, only in form and in appearance. God forbid, Allah is too, it could also be a change for the worse. It's difficult to imagine for us a regime in Eritrea Worth, worse than what we have. But it's not outside the realm of possibilities. So the change, the third option, the third scenario, is a change for the better. And for us, of course, it's this that we aim for. We want a, we want to establish a constitutional government that is committed to the rule of law, adheres to uh, democratic principles and guarantees the fundamental freedoms and basic rights of the Eritrean people. It's this kind of change that we wish to have. And if we want to have this kind of change, we must proactively 
prepare for it. We must prepare the groundwork today. Because tomorrow we will reap only what we sow today. We cannot expect to get something tomorrow that we have not worked for today, that we have not prepared the ground for work for it today. <coughs> We must also realize that when we are working for change, there are challenges that we need to be aware of and we need to minimize or overcome their negative consequences on our struggle for change. First, of course, there are the d domestic challenges. The domestic challenges are associated with the regime, with the present regime. Because the authoritarian regime today, you, call, you say authoritarian, what do you mean by authoritarian? What are the salient characteristics? What are the salient features of this regime? How does this regime operate? How does it sustain itself in power? What are its strengths and its weaknesses? How can we weaken it? How can we diminish its strengths and, of course, uh, augment <coughs> its weaknesses? So we must understand this regime. It's an absolute dictatorship. It's extremely predatory. It's wasteful. It's dysfunctional. It's malevolent. And it's also, it operates with extreme impunity. What do we mean by this? I will explain each of them in detail. It's an absolute, when we say it's an absolute dictatorship, the present regime is an outright dictatorship that has usurped absolute power, that possesses no functional state organs or government institutions, and that prolongs its rule through resort to coercion and violent force. Anyone who criticizes anyone with a different perspective, anyone who resists some of its directives is detained and from that moment on he or she is not heard of or heard from. It's an absolute dictatorship. It's also extreme predation, predatory, having monopolized the country's natural, economic, social and cultural resources it devises various pretexts to plunder state assets and extort, extort money from the people. They have different. There are who are uh, help for martyrs, uh, children, for uh, uh, war veterans, for etc., etc., etc. Two percent, Hawaii uh, rehabilitation tax, etc., etc. It's also extremely wasteful. It's a profligate regime that squanders the nation's productive manpower, the revenues from the extraction of the country's natural resources and state assets and public finances at will. In other words, it's a country that does not, it's a government actually, that for 27 years now has had no publicly declared budget. No one knows, except maybe a handful, what the revenues of this government are, what the origin of revenues is, what the expenditures are, how they are decided. They are done whimsically. For instance, nobody knows where revenues from the Bishop Gold Mine, now maybe copper, silver, and now the, the, the potash mines in, in, in Dunkirk, etc., etc. In a properly functioning state, revenues from the extraction of these natural resources should have been used to improve fi public finance, to improve the living condition of the people, to uplift the standard of living of the people, etc. 
but we don't know where they go. And then also this, kind of this regime is characterized by extreme dysfunction. It's a dysfunctional regime preoccupied with self-aggrandizement. The self-aggrandizement, maybe I was explaining the, how it self-aggrandized itself uh, uh, in an earlier discussion. But we can, uh, we can detail it later if necessary. It's a defunct regime that has failed to provide for the basic necessities of the people. It's also an archaic regime that manages a degrading coupon economy in the 21st century. An, ab <coughs> an abominable regime characterized by rampant corruption. You can take any sector. In any sector, there is rampant corruption. I think uh, it was Lord Acton who said that power tends to corrupt, and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. In 1991, when the EPLF took physical control of Eritrea by military means. It declared a provisional government pending the conduct of a referendum. After the referendum, a Eritrea became formally, de facto, as well as de jure now, an independent sovereign state, and therefore a transition government was declared. The transition was intended to last for a maximum of four years in order to enable the drafting and ratification of a constitution after which there would be an election and there would be a democratically elected government in the country. That never came to pass. And the third is constitute an inclusive democratic government that represents the entire people of Eritrea is put in or out of power or end out of power with the free will of the people and ensures special protection for women and minority rights. Four, institute a decentralized administrative system allowing the people to manage their daily life as they deem fit and have a voice in the political, economic, social, and cultural decisions that affect their livelihood. Five, improve the livelihood of the people and deliver prosperity by formulating and implementing a macroeconomic policy framework that mobilizes the productive potential of Eritrea's manpower and kickstarts economic development. Six, cultivate new regional relations based on peaceful coexistence and good neighborliness by focusing on political cooperation and economic integration that guarantees the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and peaceful development of the state of Eritrea. With that, I thank you for your kind attention. And uh, I think somehow will open the floor for discussion. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, if any of you have questions or if you would like to share your thoughts on what has been discussed. Uh, you're all welcome. Uh, who would like to start? Okay. Um, yeah, I can speak from here. Uh, okay, have you can you mapped the uh, political forces that might be an uh, issue when it comes to democratizing the country? Or have it been done before? Have you mapped? Yeah. 
Okay, we will we will uh, first collect all the questions yes. and then you will answer all at once. Okay. Do you want to ask? No. Yeah. Okay. Anyone is welcome. Even if, if even if it's outside these topics that we ha we have discussed, <coughs> you're all welcome. We can discuss anything that you have about Eritrea, anything at all. Some of you have never come to Eritrean meetings or seminars before, I'm sure. So you can ask whatever comes to mind if it concerns Eritrea, please, or what what you do, you'd like to see. <coughs> So I have two questions. Okay. The first one is, do you have any tips on books written about Eritrea politically and historically uh, by Eritrea uh, audience? And that's why near from books that, not, uh, that doesn't um, encourage the Eritrean regime. So books that you can read, uh, especially as diaspora, which leads uh, to my second question. How can you, as an Eritrean diaspora child, be more active? Uh, in the Eritrea questions. I'm thinking about my background. Um, my parents didn't grow up but half their lives in Eritrea. My mom was born in Sudan. So how can you connect more with the problems, uh, with the political problems in Eritrea, and um, not knowing maybe that much or having that much people uh, left in the country? Thank you. The first question, have you mapped the political forces? I think the task of the democratic movement that needs to be established needs to identify the internal forces of resistance, identify the pro-democracy forces outside, come together in a coalition. It doesn't have to be one organization. You can have different, as many organizations as you want. Even in an independent Eritrea, once you have, uh, once you have a democratic system of government, you will have, of course, rules, laws, rules defining what constitutes a political party, a civic, orga a civil organi a civic organization actually inside Eritrea, etc., etc. And at that moment, however, we have to identify certain core values, core principles around which we can coalesce. Set our priorities. Because we have limited time, limited resources, if we want to achieve something tangible, we must prioritize our objectives, number one, two, three. But to do that, we need to come together 
and agree on these priorities. And then, once we agree on these priorities, then we can develop a division of labor. We can stay in our respective organizations, but we can coalesce our effort. We can bring our resources together, our energies together, and if we, are, if we manage to do that, we can achieve synergy. The outcome would be much larger than the sum of the individual efforts or group efforts. So these are things we need to think about and come together to work out. I don't think there is a blueprint now for changing Eritrea. There are so many ideas, yes, but there is no blueprint and there is no really silver spoon, so to speak. But we need to come together and hopefully the outcome of our coming together of our internal debates, of our dialogue, would be agreement on the map you're talking about, on the future of Eritrea that we want, and how we can bring it, or how we can make it happen. So this is, I think, the work that we should uh, engage now and in the immediate future. My question was more aimed at political threats or going from this uh, dictatorship to a democratic government. Yes, of course. Uh, I did not want to repeat myself, but the, the political threats, some of them are regional. Okay? And I try briefly mention them. If you want, I can go into detail with everyone. But the most important are also the domestic challenges we face. That, look, uh, in Eritrea, you have no rule of law. It's the only government or the only regime that does not have even a nominal parliament. Okay? Throughout Eritrea, in the different parts of Eritrea, there are what we call customary laws, Hagen Dabba. In fact, I am convinced that Eritreans, if they are left alone, they don't need a central government. But because of the volatility of the region, we need somebody to defend us, somebody to build infrastructures, public services, etc., etc. And that's the fact. Otherwise, the people of Eritrea have a long, long tradition of self-governance at the village level, at the community level, at the etc., etc. We can go into that. Okay. The problem today is people, country, they endure. They last long. Governments come and go. And this government, like any other government, would come to fall one day, sooner or later. If we do our homework, if we are effective in what we do, we can accelerate this downfall. Otherwise, really, really, whether we like it or not, it will fall. Okay? The danger then is there is no institutional mechanism for succession for succession to ISIS. What happens then? Okay? So that's a, a dire threat if you want. And there are no forums where our people at different levels can come together, discuss this problem, and find a solution out. So the absence of representative bodies to discuss our situation, what policies we should follow, what we should do, etc., etc. And the fact that there is no institutional mechanism for succession, what happens? There is the risk of a political vacuum. And when there is a political vacuum, we learned long time ago, I mean, for you probably recently, that nature does not allow a vacuum. Negative forces, all kinds of negative forces from the region, for can step in, to fill in that vacuum, okay? So these are the problems we face. So if we want change, we must, we must, of necessity, come together and try to manage that change so that there will be an orderly transition from this dictatorship, from this authoritarian government to a democratic form of government. 
That's why we need a transition, and the transitional period needs preparation, prudence, and of course wisdom. So these are some of the risks we can discuss. There are others, but this is the most important, I think. What is the Eritrean dilemma? I really don't know. There may be there are many dilemmas. <laughs> okay. so many. What I don't understand personally is I know all kinds of people and I deal, I interact. Because I travel, I meet Eritreans everywhere. My friends who are with me, etc., even Eritreans in the US, Eritreans in Africa all over Africa. There are people who still take this rigid partisanship. This binary view I was discussing in Tigrinya in the earlier discussion. You are either for me or against me. You are either with me or against me. If, if I don't agree on everything with Abdel Karim, then I take Abdel Karim as my enemy. I do not envisage the possibility that we can disagree on some things, we agree on some things, so we can discuss, expand our areas of agreement to find common ground, and then narrow down our areas of disagreement and work together on those areas we, we agree on. That's not in our mindset. Our mindset is, if you don't agree with me, you are against me. This mehir to for the net. Tulazi, I'll give you the example of uh, my children. In the English Premiership, one supports Manchester United, the other Chelsea. You know? And I watch the game, the games with them. They fight. When they accuse the, 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 the referee, I mean, if he, if he gives a penalty or, a, or whatever, or if he doesn't see a, a tackle and he doesn't uh, give a free kick, etc., etc., oh, this we, etc., they, they really are ready to fight. And I say, why? Look, the game is, the referee was okay. If it's against Manchester, the one who is a, a fan of Manchester will never accept or a Chelsea who never accept. So I liken this because those who support the regime, misguided but blind support, nothing worth criticizing. Everything must be commended, supported. And he said, look, what about this, this uh, senior, former senior officials? Who are the historical leaders of the movement? Where are they? Why? Why are we this? Why are we that? Why are that? Externalize the problem. Oh, because of sanctions, because of America, because of Oyane, because of that, of that. So the dilemma is the inability to accept reality as it is. Because you're misguided by this binary mindset of the world. If Samar and I are not on the same wavelength on everything, we become enemies. Even in the face of evidence that things are not as cozy, as rosy as they claim to be in Eritrea. Like I've got this uh, uh, website, Eri Platform. You know, every day I get so many abuses. You, Nai, Wayani, CIA, this, that, this, that, this, that. Okay? But what I present there is concrete. For instance, national service. You know, this is the age of technology. This is the age of science. You don't need to be uh, breaking stones or uh, querying stones with, with, with the things our forefathers did. I mean, there's machinery today. <coughs> Okay? But still, still, people believe that this is the right thing to do. Look, Eritrea has a very strategic location. 
Eritrea could easily become a services center. Financial services, which we tried to do when I was in the Central Bank, transport services, tourism, etc., etc., etc. Okay? Despite all that, there are people, educated people, who can read, who can read not just literally to read and write, but who can read the reality, who can analyze and reach conclusions that reflect the reality as it is, not as the reality as fed them by the official narrative <coughs> of the government. This to me is incredible. How can this be so blind in their perspective? So supportive of a regime that's destroying the country, disrupting our society, paralyzing every aspect of our national life. Can, that, can, can they see that? That to me may be a dilemma. Maybe I should, I should stop here. You go the other question. Okay. Okay. Yes, about actually a double uh, response. Uh, you asked the other books about it. We this one here, and I think this Tariq al Harak al Islamiyah by Dr. Idris. And this is the Eritrea at a crossroads a narrative of uh, triumph, betrayal, and hope. Why did I write it? It's actually a very long question. Uh, I had a long answer, but I'll make it very brief. I infested my youth for my country. I was studying at Harvard, I was doing my PhD, I stopped, went to fight. Okay. Why did I fight? Not just me. Why did generations of Eritreans fight this long war, this 30 year war? We fought for freedom, we fought for democracy, we fought for prosperity. And today, if you look at the reality in Eritrea, we ended up with the polar opposites of the objectives that we fought for. Why? Why? Are we condemned to stay where we are, or do we have a hope? So I wrote this book in the first place to contribute to a common understanding of the history of Eritrea, of the present situation of Eritrea, and of what needs to be done to save and secure Eritrea's future. Because generations of Eritreans paid a huge sacrifice, not just those who were killed, those who were made, but everyone. There is an opportunity cost. Maybe this is a, a term. You know, people have choices. People left families, professions, work, children, etc., etc., to go fight for the right self-determination of the Eritrean people. The right self-determination for me, and I, I articulate it here, has three dimensions. First, the right of Eritrea as a nation. That we got, and that was affirmed by the referendum. Eritrea became an independent sovereign state. The right of the people of Eritrea's self-determination, the right of Eritrea as a people's self-determination, that right has been denied to date. The people of Eritrea have never had the chance, the opportunity to elect a government of their choice. They are administered by this unelected government 27 years and continue. How can we change that? We need to change that, etc., etc. So I wrote this in order to contribute to the struggle for change. Yes, we have uh, gotten rid of a foreign oppressor, but it was not our intention to replace that foreign oppressor by a local oppressor. Oppression is the same. It's colorblind or it can be foreign. It's all the same. The objective consequences of oppression are the same. Yes, Eritrea is independent, is an Eritrean government, etc. But more Eritreans, a larger proportion of Eritreans is outside the country today than during the war. Why? You know, I, I, I spent my youth fighting for what I thought would be a, a, a future that's better than what we had. But when people tell me, okay, we were better off under the dirt, that kills, that hurts. I spent my time, my youth, 
abandon all the opportunities in front of me, going to the best university in the world, or the same, and then ending up with this. This is Eritrea's predicament. We fought so hard. We won against overwhelming odds. Nobody expected us to win. We won. And yet we ended up. And many people, in fact, this is the, the answer to the dilemma. Many people do not understand why Eritreans fought so courageously, so heroically, built an effective military machine to defeat one of Africa's best equipped and largest armies, European Air Force, Navy, the Army, etc., etc. And yet we end up in, 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 in an authoritarian dictatorship. This is Eritrea's dilemma. And of course, how this is, uh, we discussed earlier. I think these are the, the Okay, the, the remaining questions. questions, I'll be ready to answer them for you anytime. So, tell your parents to contact me to answer you. Your parents know who I am, and I'll be more than ready to inform you about any books about Eritrea, about going back to Eritrea. I will show you the dangers, and then you will decide for yourself, not your parents, okay? Mm -hmm. But I will tell you exactly what Eritrea really looks like, okay? And the remaining questions, I'll be more than ready to explain each and everything for you. So tell your parents to contact me, okay? Thank you for today. Thank you.